A 23-year-old man, enraged at society, goes on a murderous rampage killing nine people over the course of eight days, resulting in a hotel being set ablaze in a massive gunfight, where a Marine Corps veteran stole a helicopter, filled it with police snipers, and conducted strafing runs on the hotel in an attempt to bring the violence to an end. This is the story of Mark Essex, the 1973 New Orleans sniper. Essex grew up in Emporia, Kansas, and experienced a normal childhood, where he was regarded well by his teachers. After high school, he attended Emporia State University, but dropped out shortly after. Unsure of what to do with his future, his father, a U.S. Army veteran, suggested he enlist. He took his father's advice, but opted to enlist in the U.S. Navy at the age of 19. Completing his basic training with exceptional results, he would later enroll in the Navy Dental Center. While in dental training, he took a job as a bartender at an enlisted men's club, but quickly grew to dislike it as he discovered that certain rooms were off limits to blacks. Essex continued to be harassed and approached a black recruiter about it, who told him that it would likely subside when he hit a higher rank. However, Essex reached the rank of seaman, and the harassment continued, resulting in a physical altercation with an NCO over a racist comment. Unable to handle the racism, he would abandon his post two months later, remaining AWOL for a month. Essex returned to Imperial Beach, where he agreed to plead guilty to desertion. One of his lieutenants spoke highly of him at the hearing, saying he was a hard worker and that his desertion was strictly because of discrimination. The courts decided a fair punishment was for two months of his pay to be returned. Without a direction in life and a growing hatred, Essex moved to Upper Manhattan and joined the New York chapter of the Black Panthers, where he was referred to as Mata, a Swahili word for the hunter's bow. This furthered his radicalization and he began to study guerrilla warfare and adopt the extremist views of the 1968 book Black Rage. He would then purchase his first firearm, a Ruger 44, and began to constantly practice with it on the outskirts of Emporia. Over the next year, he moved four times across the country until he ultimately ended up in Central City, New Orleans. Through the Total Community Action Program, he enrolled in classes on vending machine repair and African studies. Sitting alone in his small apartment, he would memorize Swahili and Zulu phrases and write them across his walls and ceilings. Due to his depression, he continued to isolate himself and later purchased a second firearm, a Colt 38 revolver. His parents grew worried about him until he paid a surprise visit and appeared happy and upbeat. They felt relieved that he seemed to have recovered from the Navy. Two months later, during a campus protest at the Southern University over the school's poor living conditions and lack of resources, two students by the name of Leonard Brown and Denver Smith were shot and killed by East Baton Rogue parish officers. Essex heard the news and hit a tipping point. He wrote a letter to his mom saying, Africa, this is it, mom. It's even bigger than you and I, even bigger than God. I have now decided that the white man is my enemy. I will fight to gain my manhood or die trying. Love, Jimmy. Essex would then write a letter to a New Orleans TV station and stated he was going to attack the New Orleans Police Department on December 31st over the killing of the two Southern University students. On New Year's Eve, Essex parked his car a block from the New Orleans Police Department retrieved a duffel bag from the trunk, and made his way to a poorly lit parking lot across from the police station, hiding between cars. He braced his rifle and shot at 19-year-old cadet Bruce Weatherford. As he walked towards the police gatehouse to report for duty, Weatherford dove for cover behind a car while the man he was relieving, 19-year-old Alfred Harrell, ran to his aid. Essex shot him in the chest and wounded a second responding officer, Lieutenant Horace Perez. After firing six shots, Essex detonated several firecrackers as a distraction, escaped over a fence, and made his way to the industrial side of town. Needing to get off the streets, he shot open the lock to a small warehouse and made his way inside, unknowingly setting off a silent alarm. Two officers responded to the scene, unaware that the break-in was connected to the previous shooting, and swept the premises without noticing a method of entry. Returning to their squad car to get their service dog, Essex emerged from the darkness and shot Officer Edwin Hosley Sr. in the back and then fired multiple rounds at Officer Harold Blappert. Pinned down, Blappert radioed for backup and fired four shots at Essex. Over 30 officers responded to the scene, but found nothing but a bloody handprint and a 38 revolver. Police executed a massive house-to-house -house search of the surrounding area for the shooter, but ultimately they called off the search. Later that night, two blocks from the warehouse, 
The pastor of the new St. Mark Baptist Church entered his church and was surprised to find a man armed with a rifle standing inside. The pastor quickly fled the church and reported the break-in to the police. Unfortunately, by the time the police made it to the church, Essex was nowhere to be found. However, after the police had left, Essex snuck back into the church and continued to hide out for three days in need of supplies. Essex made his way to a nearby grocery store. The owner of the store noticed that Essex had a bloodied bandage around his hand and told one of his employees to follow him. The employee reported back that he had gone inside the church. Police were called, but they only found a bag of 38 caliber bullets and a letter written by Essex, apologizing to the pastor for breaking into the church. Four days later, Essex stormed into the same grocery store, began shouting at the owner, and then shot him multiple times, severely wounding him. Running out of the store, Essex quickly carjacked a motorist idling outside the store and fled the scene, flying down the road. He pulled the car into the 17-story Howard Johnson's Hotel parking garage and attempted to access the building from the fire escape. He asked two hotel staff to let him in the building, but they refused. Noticing the rifle, they fled and called the police. After trying every door, he came to the last floor and found the door propped open, giving him access to the hotel. As he made his way down the hall, he shot and killed 28-year-old Dr. Robert Stegall and his wife as they exited their room. Inside the couple's room, he set the phone books on fire and placed them under the curtains before dropping a pan-African flag beside the bodies. As he descended to the 11th floor, he continued to set fire to rooms and shot and killed the hotel manager. The first two officers at the scene, Michael Burl and Robert Childress, began to sweep each floor. While on a lower floor, an employee told the officers that the shooter was on one of the upper floors. The officers entered the elevator and ascended to the 18th floor, but became trapped due to smoke in the elevator shaft. In the meantime, Essex would kill one more person. A large number of police and firefighters arrived on the scene and quickly established a perimeter. Firefighters immediately tried to rescue hotel guests who were trapped on their balconies, but they were under heavy fire from Essex, making rescues difficult. A firefighter and two officers attempted to climb a ladder in an effort to rescue two people stuck on a balcony, but Essex popped out of a room and shot the firefighter, sending him tumbling down into the officers below. They managed to get the firefighters to an ambulance, but as the ambulance was leaving, the driver was shot. Minutes later, a police sniper made his way into an apartment across the street to get an angle on the shooter. Immediately upon opening a window to get a better view, he was shot in the jaw, tearing it to pieces. He walked himself to a nearby hospital to seek treatment. Over the next hour, Essex would shoot four more officers before making his way to the roof and taking cover inside a concrete cube as his ammo reserves were near empty. However, what no one was prepared for was Lieutenant General Pittman. Pittman was the commander of the Marine Air Reserve training in Louisiana and was closely watching the shooting unfold on TV. Unable to sit back and watch, he quickly assembled a crew and, without authorization, commandeered a CH-46 helicopter and flew to the scene. Pittman was no stranger to combat. He was a decorated Vietnam veteran who flew multiple combat missions in Vietnam and survived being shot down seven times. Upon arrival, Pitman landed the helicopter and allowed five police snipers to board. He then conducted multiple strafing runs on Essex's position, firing hundreds of rounds. Essex remained in the cube for over seven hours. Officers attempted to persuade him to come out, but he refused. Growing restless, authorities considered an assault on his position until Essex unpromptedly sprinted out of the cube shouting, Come and get me before being shot by all surrounding officers, including the helicopter. Essex would be shot over 200 times. In total, 21 people were injured and nine were killed. May these officers and members of the public rest in peace.